an ancient and very complicated culture with many connections to other parts of the world. In this episode, Under the Carpet, we're going to present a more complete picture of New Zealand and her very complex past. In the first episode of Skeletons in the Cupboard, we explored the story of the red-haired people of New Zealand and their arrival into the Pacific via Peru and Easter Island. We met Monica Matamua, whose DNA ancestry dated back to ancient Persia. And we heard from a number of historians, all of whom offered information about hidden evidence and lost archeology. span Before that, in Cousins Across the Sea, we delved even further back to an ancient legend which told of the early Hawaiians coming from Alaska, a legend that has been buried in the vaults of the Bishop Museum in Honolulu. The common thread in these two films is the hiding, the obfuscation of important oral histories and the disparaging of proven yet inconvenient evidence. In this episode, we're going to go deeper, under the layers of lava, volcanic ash, sand and embargoes, to discover the deepest, darkest history of New Zealand and to find out just how long people have really been living here. Let's begin by listening to Barry Brailsford's thoughts on this subject. I think back to 40, 50 years ago when the great mission was to find where the Māori came from. And everyone was looking for one source, the one way. There's one answer for everything. No way for one way. So you get those people who use things like stone adzes and whatever to track the Māori back up into the area near China, Taiwan and whatever and say, well, the adzes prove it, it's in the stone. But then you get other people like Tohaya Dal who said, well, actually, there are things that suggest they might have come from South America or elsewhere in North America, who knows, but you know, let's keep the story open and see where it goes. So this whole matter of who reached New Zealand and when is now, as far as I'm concerned, a very open book. Another author, Gary Cook, who is also interested in this early history, agrees it's a very open book. It certainly is. The Secret Land of People Before was a book which was inspired by the fact that for many, many years, from uh, a very, very young boy, I'd heard stories of the fact that there may have been other people living in New Zealand prior to the people we know as Māori coming to this land. In our research, we started to discover that there was archival material in libraries and museums around the country in the form of early writings by anthropologists and uh, early explorers in this land, in the forms of diaries and reports in the journals of the Polynesian Society and the transactions of the New Zealand Institute. And we went through what I call the discarded history. The historians of today don't recognise and we came up with this book, The People Before.
So what did Gary find in the country's archives? An amazing event took place in 1874 in Auckland, right in the centre of what is now Auckland City. And workmen were working in a street called Coburg Street, which is now uh, High Street, on the intersection of Wellesley Street, right near, outside, where the present-day art gallery is. Behind the art gallery, of course, is Albert Park. And it's well known by a lot of people that uh, Albert Park was a volcanic vent which extruded lava many, many thousands of years ago. So the workmen were putting in this deep trench. They went down many, many feet. They chipped away through uh, two different lava flows and they had an engineer with them and he actually did drawings um, as they went down through the layers, through the clays and the lava. They got below the last lava flow and lo and behold there was a blackened tree stump there. Alongside the tree stump was an ads. And they pulled the tree stump out to examine it further because it had been cut. And it was a manuka tree um, and it was a, quite a wide girth. But the thing is, talking to geologists, there is a variance in the time that they give, but anywhere between 30,000 and 60,000 years is what some geologists say that those lava flows came out of that vent in Alba Park in the middle of Auckland. So what we have to ask is who was there cutting Manuka tree down that long ago? It's a good question. Who were they? Naitahu oral tradition talks of an ancient tribe living around Lake Hawea in the South Island who had dark skin, curly hair and skinny legs, very similar in appearance to the Australian Aboriginal. Their tools were also very similar and it was said they had come from a land to the west. Genetic studies have pointed to a global expansion of a people from Africa known as the Australoids 50 to 70,000 years ago. Remnant populations of this group survive today in the DNA of the Indian Veda, the Andaman Islanders, the Ainu of Hokkaido, Japan, the people of Tierra del Fuego and the Australian Aboriginal. The Chatham Islanders, or the Moriori, are believed to be a relic population of the early inhabitants of New Zealand and in this picture, they do resemble the Australian Aboriginal. Naitahu also assert that these people live on in their DNA to this day. But much has happened in the last 40,000 years. New Zealand's position on a tectonic plate boundary puts it in the firing line for devastating geological events as told to us by John Johnson from the Gum Diggers Park. There uh, have been numerous disasters in New Zealand um, uh, in the Alpuri Peninsula here. The entire forest is wiped here, out here twice we know of. So, uh, entire forest, not just the old tree, they were completely mm. obliterated by some disastrous event. And then again, 45,000 years ago, uh, mm. another disaster, um, tsunami generated by perhaps comet asteroid impacts in the Tasman. Also there was one 6,000 years ago in a place called Henderson Bay where the, the deposits of a tsunami um, from perhaps the Kermadec Trench or one of the tectonic plates out in Tasman, um, uh, they found uh, deposits of, I think it was 32 metres above current sea level, which was, uh, it was just a deposit, so the wave perhaps was a lot higher than that. And I suppose because we're a fairly low-lying peninsula, we, we're susceptible to those sort of events. Um, who knows what's going to happen next? New Zealand has, without doubt, suffered many natural catastrophes that have annihilated populations over the millennia. For instance, the Oroa Nui explosion 26 and a half thousand years ago that was a hundred times the volume of the last Taupo eruption. That would have laid waste to the entire country and its inhabitants. 
Even the much smaller eruption of Mount Tarawera devastated the local population. These volcanoes expel huge amounts of ash into the atmosphere, blocking out the sun's rays and causing major climatic upheaval around the world. The largest volcanic eruption in the last 7,000 years was the Rinjani volcano on Lombok, Indonesia, which erupted in 1257 AD, disrupting life in the Pacific for centuries, as mentioned here by Barry Brailsford. Something horrendous happened in the Pacific after the year 1200. In a matter of generations, there was huge climatic change and it's coming again. We now know that the oceans warmed up by something like one to two degrees. When the oceans warm up like that, the corals die. The coral fish that feed on the corals die. And the fish that feed on the coral fish die and the food chain breaks down. Today, archaeologists believe that in a few generations, the Polynesians lost 80% of their food resources. But not only that, there was a huge change in terms of the weather patterns. After 1200, there was a huge increase in these El Nino events. So the whole of that tropical, subtropical area was affected hugely by swings and the weather patterns from year to year. They could have fierce winds, hurricane type events, amazing rainfalls, and then that could be followed by years of drought. You see, if you just think about it, you have two islands and they're only half a day or a day's canoe journey apart. And one happens to be in the path of good rains, and the other continues in drought. And the one with the rain, they get their taro crop, they get other things, they can feed their children. But on the other island, the children die. Out of this kind of incredible stress upon society came conflict. And that conflict continued and developed and grew until to protect their children, to ensure the survival of life, they developed the warrior culture. The people of the Pacific reacted predictably to the devastation of the environment and their food resources, but this was by no means the end of it. Well, as the uh, Maori stories go, fiery things coming out of the sky. There's a very interesting story in the South Island. And it looks like this event would have occurred just over 500 years ago. And the Maori and Maori legends down there, they say that the sky was full of fire and fire came down close to the earth and set the forests on fire and then the fire descended into the ocean out of sight of the land. Now, it's fascinating that probably about 10 years ago, an Australian um, geophysicist working with a undersea exploration company noticed a very large crater on the floor of the Southern Ocean, not far from Stewart Island. The survey ship was able to go across this gigantic crater and they pulled up samples from the ocean floor uh, not very deep in the sediment, which were tektites. So therefore, there was an event which occurred 500 years ago, and the resulting tsunami swept right up the coast of New Zealand, and it is believed also, this answers a query that many scientists in Australia have had for many years, why was there um, sea debris way up the Sydney Harbour, up towards the Blue Mountains, and caused devastation there as well. So this was a mighty event, and it was a catastrophic event. Not only do Maoris record this event as the fires of Tamatea and the Mahuika comet impact, it was also recorded by the Chinese, who happened to be there at the time. 
Yes, it's very interesting because in the book published um, a few years ago by Gavin Menzies, the year the Chinese discovered the world in 1421, the fleet which set out from China under the Admiral Zheng Hui uh, divided into four different uh, flotillas and a flotilla that came into the southern oceans and dipped down towards the Antarctic and then uh, up towards New Zealand, well documented in Chinese literature, they were engulfed by this fiery cataclysmic event and the record shows that nearly all the ships in this flotilla were set on fire and then subsequently what was left was sunk by the massive tsunami with the exception of one of the big ships which was sheltered in the lee side of an island and they survived and took the story back. What evidence is there that the Chinese visited New Zealand? On the northern side of the Hokianga, there is or up in the ridge, well, they call it an ancient Chinese fort. It's, a pass it's carved out of uh, limestone, rooms off and what have you, about 150 metres long. But unfortunately it's all covered with sand now and uh, pine tree. But down in the valley below that 1902, um, old Percy Harrison's a kid, him and another fellow rode over that side and came across all these plates and china and uh, bronze cannon and what have you. Vince Heatley saw this with his own eyes when he was a child. This would have been 1959, 1960 thereabouts. Older brother and I, we were down at the sand hills at Okanani and we're looking out towards the sea. Down in the sand hollows was this, which I've put a bit of sketch on. We could see about 25 to 30 yards of it sticking out of the sand and Somebody has spent a lot of time digging this out. I couldn't climb from the bottom up onto the top. They were about a good four feet high. And I remember running into each of these little rooms and climbing up the sand and getting up on top and calling out my, my brother, Alan, here I am. And I'd, I'd run down and I'd run into a different one again. All the way around the, the rooms, there were these holes dug into this white lime rock. And when you dug down into the hole, there's a burnt log, a burnt column. The stump. They were all the way around it, as though it had had a roof framework it. and something coming up over it. Unfortunately, there has been no archaeological dig on this site, so we're unable to say how old it is or who built it. I, I, over the years, I've asked a lot of people if they've ever seen them, and they all look at me and laugh. And this old elderly <laughs> gentleman. I remember rightly, I think is, is an unusual name. His name was Friday Selwyn, and he was well in the 70s, late, late, late 70s. And as a kid, he could remember seeing them. No. And he's the only person that I've spoken to. He drew a sketch with a stick on the sand at Kotu Point, just about the same as what I'd seen. Good he said, I can remember seeing that when I was a kid, and I've never seen it since and I have been back to the sand hills many times never seen them. I'll tell you something else that we found down there one day. On the sand hills, yeah. the different time we've gone down from this, closer to the water and around towards the North Head Wall, we were walking along just after a storm, up on, on the sand hills still, and we found five wooden crates. Big wooden crates. I couldn't climb on top of them, they were too tall for me. The wind had blown all the sand away from them. Now these boxes had no nails in them. The, all, of, all held together with wooden dowels had been mm -hmm. driven in, in through it. So we managed to get the knife in and lever and lever and we broke some of these little bits of doweling off and we got the first bit of wood off. And inside it was the weirdest looking straw I've ever seen. It was straw bigger than my finger, real mm -hmm. coarse looking straw. And the next minute Alan picks up a plate and he says, look at this thing. And there's a, a white plate like this, and he says, look at these funny looking pictures. And they had these funny pictures all the way around the outside. And they were blue, everything was painted blue around the outside. And it was blue, funny shaped blue buildings with things sticking up on the corners of the roofs. And I hold it up to the light, and next thing, you can see through this, look, you know, there's the sun. We thought, bloody sun. hell. Yeah. So we're looking at this thing there, and what are you going to do with these? And 
Next thing. Good frisbee, so. <gasps> I shouldn't tell you, should I? But I tell you, we made some unbelievable frisbees. You, you chuck one and we get another one out and we'll chuck it to see if we could break them. Well, we, we did, we broke quite a few of them. But we had no idea the value no, of the things. God. We didn't know what they were. They were just somebody who left a great big boxes full of dinner plates there. Vince's description of translucent eggshell porcelain plates gives us a fairly good indication of its age as this type of china was produced during the Ming Dynasty from 1402 to 1424. So this fits in, in principle, with the Chinese voyages of 1421. But was this their only visit? Well, on the coast here we've got a 110 officially recorded wrecks. And I found another 57 and it's these unknown ones that you know I'm very, very interested in. And uh, there was this washout um, yeah, October, November, and one of my team uh, was up the beach and saw these ribs sticking out. Uh, last year came uncovered all these ribs over 400 feet long, 180 foot beam and timber off. We've had the timber dated and we believe it could be a, a Chinese, ancient Chinese junk. They're yeah, buried in under the sand approximately where we are here. This is the top end of the ribs that were showing and they went out on an angle out here to below low water mark and we measured out 412 feet and there was another one or two further out. And then over here, approximately 180 feet across, there was some of the, uh, what we, hit, the starboard ribs sticking out. Only out for two days, I got notified about it. We came up here the next morning, cut the uh, sample timbers off. This is what I like to do with all shipwrecks and get uh, a country of origin and then get it dated. And uh, two days later, the beach was like this again. We've been waiting for it to scour out again, but no such luck. But... The, this is uh, a section of the top of the, one of the ribs and they, we believe it's Chinese Yunmu and it's been dated in three different independent laboratories around the world. But they couldn't believe the bloody age of it. So they sent to other, two other independent laboratories around the world and the timber comes out with a dating of 5,995 years old. But we're looking at the Dao dynasty, the Hermuda people. The Hermuda culture was a seafaring nation who lived by the Yellow Sea between 7,500 and 5,000 years ago. Their DNA is believed to be ancestral to the Polynesians. A paper published by Professor Haikai Tane asserts that the Hermuda people were making regular trips across the Pacific. It had always been assumed that they sailed bamboo rafts with multiple centerboards. But the 400 foot long shipwreck discovered by Noel Hilliam challenges our perception of the shipbuilding capabilities of these people. Uh, hand, hand, Please explain what that is. That, that is a uh, handmade sun dried fabric, complete with the, the Coolies logo on the end. They got a, a grain of rice for every one of these made. And where's that one from? Uh, up near the timbers of this wreck on the coast here. Oh, true. But perhaps someone might be able to recognise the symbol, the family. <laughs> Coincidentally, Hawaii Loa, the legendary discoverer of Hawaii, was from the Yellow Sea. According to ancient Hawaiian legend, his vessel was so big, it was often called an island and his voyages would last for over a year. Hawaiian oral history says that his brothers Kanaloa and Ki colonized the Marquesas and Tahiti respectively, and a grandson settled Samoa. Were Hawaii Loa and his brothers sailing these massive 400-foot ships 5,000 years ago? Further evidence that people were navigating the Pacific at the height of the Hamudu culture was uncovered by archaeologist Masashi Chikamori 
on Rarotonga, where he found a cooking pit over 5,000 years old. If a boatload of people from East Asia did arrive in New Zealand that long ago, what other evidence is there to support it? Professor Haikai Tane published a paper in China on the discovery of icons which were carved in a rock shelter in the South Island, which are ancient Taoist Chinese, which go back in New Zealand four and a half thousand years. The main feature of it was a New Zealand famous rock carving called the Rua Tanifa. And the Tanifa, of course, is a mythological uh, figure in Maori stories, often depicted in a dragon-like form and quite a fearsome creature. So this was named the Rua Tanifa. No great mystery because um, anthropologists today say that the people who came out of southern China 7,000 years ago are the Proto-Polynesians, the people that moved from southern China, southern Asia, up through the Pacific. Now what Haikai Tane found when he looked at the uh, type of carving, he could see there were features which were familiar to him as a Taoist student. So he took copies of this drawing or the carving back to China uh, to uh, his teachers who then sent it to other universities, to Taoist scholars, who then looked at the carving and said, we can read the symbology in this Rui Tanifa carving. And the carving itself, whilst it is a stylized figure, is actually a land map of the whole of the Waitaki Valley area, right from the coast, right up to Mount Cook, Mount Aorangi in the middle of the Alps. So here is an ancient map depicted on the roof of a rock overhang in the, in the middle of the South Island. But the Chinese were not the only people to sail to New Zealand. Some extraordinary discoveries in Northland over the last century shine a light on previous visitors, but they have yet to be thoroughly investigated. They include a Tamil ship's bell that was used by the Napui people as a cooking pot and a boulder found on a farm that was covered in Sanskrit writing, suggesting a Hindu presence at some time in the past. We chalked it in. And the farmer that that's on, that's saw up the Hokianga actually, uh, he will not allow anyone near. He's the same as down here. Are these relics from shipwrecked sailors? Or did these people actually contribute to Maori culture? Jason Phillips hints that the Hindu god Shiva lives on in folklore as Kiwa. We're the offspring of those who comb the long wavy hair of Kiwa. And Kiwa's the Pacific, the ocean. Yeah, god of the ocean. It was said that our sea voyaging canoes were that fast as that they skimmed the top of the waves like a brush going through your hair. Jason associates the hair of Kiwa to the waters of the Pacific Ocean, which is an interesting parallel to the hair of Shiva, from which flows the sacred waters of the Ganges. Having heard about Indian connections and Chinese visits, we're now wondering what else there is to this complex story of prehistorical New Zealand. Martin Dutre, in his book Ancient Celtic New Zealand, puts forward evidence there may have been an even earlier contribution to New Zealand culture by people from the opposite side of the world who he believes were mapping New Zealand three to four thousand years ago. Okay, we're now at Silverdale and uh, in 1971 there was a great big uh, hill here that uh, the road used to have to wind around it. So it was decided that uh, they would get rid of the hill and create this beautiful big intersection. But as they brought the machines in at the very crown of the hill, they found a cluster of 12 massive concretion boulders right on the top of the hill. Well, it was a real enigma because concretion boulders can only naturally form down in sea sediments. But these were at the top of a washed clay hill. So it was a real mystery at the time as to why they were there. 
Well, the reason that they were there is that they were part of a massive alignment system that runs right across the Auckland Isthmus. And we've traced that uh, alignment system from Pukemore Hill in Huntley through to the Mount William Walkway. It then goes uh, to Totara Park in Manukau. It then goes to a mound on the top of Mount Wellington. It then goes across uh, North Head. It then moves on to uh, Akura Ridge over this way where they built a, a mound, a great big uh, trig mound on the top of the ridge. And it then comes to here where there were the 12 concretion boulders on top of the uh, Silverdale Hill where they could work out the distances to any of the land features from working from this uh, mapping alignment. And um, I talked to a Komatua from Ngāti Kuri and he talked about how when his people arrived in New Zealand in the year 700 AD, how they encountered another people here that they called the surveyors because these people were so busy setting up uh, standing stones and uh, different types of markers across the landscape all to do with surveying and mapping the country. Let's hear a little more about these surveyors and what they did. The ancient Patupai Arahe surveyors and astronomers when they set up this particular solar observatory they uh, made it in exactly this position, they put it in exactly this position so that the sun would rise in line with the trench on Mount Wellington and when the uh, ancient Patupayarahe astronomers saw that they would know absolutely that that fixed point gave them the day of the equinox and then according to that they could do their calendar count and figure out any day throughout the entire 365.25 day year and all of the times of planting, harvesting, fish migrations, whatever. Now the spread between uh, the summer solstice back to the equinox here around the Auckland Isthmus is about 30 degrees and then of course uh, from the equinox back to the winter solstice is another 30 degrees so on the horizon we have a spread of about 60 degrees of sun movement through the, uh, through the year. Unfortunately, academia has had very little interest in dating these hilltop sites featuring standing stones, so we don't know exactly how old they are or who put them there. Was it the Celts from some post-Atlantean civilization? Or could it have been the descendants of the famous navigator and discoverer of New Zealand, Maui? As most school children know from the myths and legends, Maui ensnared the sun. This legend is a direct reference to Maui's knowledge of navigation and celestial observations. So what else do we know about Maui? Maui was basically the person who navigated the Pacific, probably navigated the world. Okay, if you go back to all the Pacific Islands history, What's the history of your islands? Maui fished it up. You come to New Zealand, the North Island, the great fish of, of Maui. You know, the South Island is, is canoe. The North Island is said to resemble a stingray, with the mouth of the ray at Palliser Bay. During Maui's circumnavigation of the South Island, and upon reaching Kaikoura, he spotted the mountains of the North Island and sailed across the Straits to Palliser Bay, where he was greeted by the red-haired chieftainess of Orokoroko. If Maui first arrived in the South Island, where did he land? According to Waitaha and Naitahu oral history, Maui came from the Southern Ocean and landed at Bruce Bay. Well, I'm standing here now at Bruce Bay and about 100 kilometers due east of me rises the highest mountain in South Island, known as Auraki or Mount Cook. This mountain on a clear day could be seen over 200 kilometers out to sea. And any sailor or navigator using the westerly wind belt known as the Roaring Forties and 
looking for land would have headed straight for it. And this is exactly what the legend of Maui says. Initially, they thought Auraki was just a mirage amongst the clouds, but before they knew it, they'd made landfall at Bruce Bay. And they came, not from the Central Pacific as previously thought, but from the Southern Ocean. So who was Maui and where did he come from? The other story that I know about Maui is that he also came from Egypt. Some insight to these questions came from epigraphic research of Barry Fell when he deciphered some ancient petroglyphs on Pitcairn Island which told of damage done to one of Maui's ships in a storm. He also deciphered petroglyphs found in a cave called Casa Pintada in the San Fernando Valley in Chile. These were written in Libyan script declaring that Maui claimed 4,000 miles of the Central and South American coastline for Egypt in 231 BC. Fell was perplexed that a Polynesian ancestral figure was claiming land for Egypt so he conducted further research and found that Maui was a navigator who'd been commissioned to circumnavigate the world by Eratosthenes, head of the Alexandria Library in Egypt under the reign of Ptolemy III. Maui had been given six ships and a crew captained by Rata. It can be deduced from petroglyphs and Polynesian legend that Maui's voyage followed a route that looked something like this. After circumnavigating New Zealand for three months, it is believed Maui travelled north to Tahiti, on to Hawaii and across to the Americas. He then sailed south for 4,000 miles along the coastline looking for a passage east. Realising that their mission to circumnavigate the world had been foiled by the impassable landmass of the Americas, they decided not to return to Egypt to face the music but instead went back to the islands where they knew they would be welcome. At this point, they entered the realms of Polynesian legend. It seems he made quite a name for himself in Tonga, where there's a massive stone archway named after him. It is called Ha'amonga Amaui, the Burden of Maui. The Tongans remember him as a navigator of high esteem and still retain a copy of his star chart to this day. Further proof of Maui's expedition came from a cave in Irian Jaya called the Cave of the Navigators, where Barry Fell deciphered images that told of Maui's visit. This clearly shows that Maui passed through the islands of eastern Indonesia reprovisioning his ships in the home of the Indonesian rice paddy rat, also known as Ratus exulans, or Kiore, the Polynesian rat. After leaving the cave of the navigators, Maui experienced strong headwinds, so he chose to head south into the westerly wind belt of the Southern Ocean, arriving at Bruce Bay with rats on board. The possibility that it was Maui who brought the Kiori to New Zealand from eastern Indonesia is strengthened by the fact that some of the earliest Kiori bones come from places that Maui visited. Shag River, Palliser Bay and Hawke's Bay. And there's an interesting thing that's come to light in more recent years and that's work done by one of the scientists uh, down at Otago University, and it is Matisha Smith. Yeah, and she is an amazing researcher, very talented woman who's unraveling so much of it for us and the new science. And this is what she shared a few years ago. When we follow the rat lines, we find there are very ancient rat lines in New Zealand, much older than to the north in the Pacific much older than those in the Cook Islands or 
Tonga or Samoa, it looks like those rats went north from here. That New Zealand was settled before many of those islands. And that turns things on its head. Lisa Matisu Smith was not the only person who was surprised by the early arrival of rats in New Zealand. This is what Richard Holdaway had to say. I'm an extinction biologist and one of the main thrusts of my research is to find out when the first predators in, in, arrived in New Zealand and one of those was the Pacific rat. The first series of dates showed that the rats had been in the South Island for at least 2,000 years. This is completely contrary to the accepted, accepted dogma, which is that they arrived at the time of settlement, which is now agreed at seven to 800 years ago. And it's completely agreed that they came with people. Any other hypothesis just doesn't work. So whoever brought the rats must have arrived in New Zealand and must have visited both the North and South Islands 2,000 years ago. That date was so early, scientists questioned the carbon dates some other form of proof was required. This cave in Hawke's Bay was buried in volcanic ash from the massive Taupo eruption 1800 years ago. The volcanic tephra flowed over the hillside and into the cave, covering everything inside in a thick layer of ash, a layer scientists can date with confidence. Now that line there was the floor of this cave about 1800 years ago when this uh, material came in across the terrain and, and into the hole and filled it up from there up to here, sort of ponded it in and sealed everything underneath. And therefore we know that the material under here is older than that. There was a bone which had been collected from beneath the ash and I dated that bone and the date was consistent with it having the rat having died before the ash fell. All we are saying is that the rats arrived around about 2,000 years ago in the North and South Island. Rats were here about 2,000 years ago. So we now have scientific confirmation through genetic and geological dating that shows that the rats arrived with people over 2,000 years ago. But A government employee by the name of Bruce McFadgen was commissioned to debunk Holdaway's work. He questioned the dating methodology, suggesting the rats had been eating thousand-year-old carbon and concocted fanciful scenarios that placed rat bones under the tephra layer by virtue of some burrowing creature, a hole-boring petrel, without any evidence of the ash being disturbed. At least, McFadgen admits that none of his scenarios prove anything. Whilst on the subject of things hidden under the carpet of ash, we were astonished by discoveries made at Lake Pukawa in the 1960s. See this bone? It's, it's not a club. It's a tibia, and it's the tibia of Dinornus giganticus, otherwise known as the moa. Now this bone was found during an archaeological excavation very close to where I am at the moment, near Lake Pukawa. And this bone was in an upright position, like this, in the lake, along with many, many others as if the moa himself had got stuck in the mud. Now the subsequent excavations by an archaeologist named Russell Price found hundreds of moa bones that had been heated and broken. Suggestion was that somebody had been eating their dinner of moa. Price deduced that the moa hunters had set a mud trap for the birds and once they were immobilised in the mud, the hunters would hit them over the head, cut the bodies off the legs still stuck in the mud and then drag them 50 metres up the slope to the campfire 
where thousands of broken bones and fat-soaked soil was found. The location of this find was underneath what is known as the tephra layer from the 186 AD Taupo volcanic eruption. The little bones from these guys were found underneath that ash. What does that signify? It signifies that there were people living there prior to that explosion and they were the moa hunters and they were eating moa for dinner. Russell Price's work was all undertaken underneath the tephra layer and he of course sent the bones off for carbon dating. Astonishing to him, the bones between the tephra layer of the 186 Taupo explosion and the next layer down of the Waimahea explosion came back at between two and three thousand years old and the bones that were found underneath the Waimahea layer came back from carbon dating at closer to 7,000 years old. Why is this 7,000 year old moa hunter history not common knowledge? Behind me here is the Te Papa Museum of Wellington. Behind those doors is a vault. In that vault lie over 10,000 burnt and broken moa bones. Are they on display at all anywhere? No. Why? Well, there appears to be an embargo on any finds, archaeological or otherwise, that suggest that there might have been people here before the official arrival date of the Maori people. It is disturbing that much of the information regarding Price's work has now been lost or hidden. And we smell a rat when we find that, once again, Bruce McFadden had been brought in to debunk evidence of early human occupation. He concocted a fanciful scenario suggesting that a large femur and other cooked moa bones had fallen down cracks in the mud thereby magically arriving beneath the ash layers. However, the dating of the bones still showed they were between 3,000 and 7,000 years old. Russell Price was crushed by this ridicule of his hard and honest work, having devoted nearly 20 years of his life to it. What is particularly intriguing is that very recently, Bruce McFadden has been involved in a similar find in the Tai Happy area, one which appears to have uncovered the presence of moa tibias, just like our Pukawa bones, in sediments below the Taupo tephra and stuck in a mud trap. To date, no torso bones have been found, which suggests that the cooking pit and midden are yet to be discovered. Now that the facts stare McFudgen in the face, will he finally admit that he was wrong and exonerate Russell Price for his groundbreaking work in the understanding of New Zealand's ancient people? The length of time that people have been living in New Zealand has been grossly misinterpreted by mainstream academia. The picture is far more complex. Now we're going to have a look at the bigger picture, the timeline of the movement of people around the world leading up to the colonisation of the Pacific and New Zealand. During the last interglacial period, over 120,000 years ago, the pygmies spread out from Africa. Then the volcano Toba erupted 74,000 years ago, decimating global populations and causing man to regroup. A taller people, who were similar to the Australian Aboriginal, emerged about 70,000 years ago and expanded across the globe. 
then the Ice Age hit 25,000 years ago, and from this period came stories of blonde-haired bearded giants followed by the redheads. Then the age of the black-haired people began about 6,000 years ago. Within this time frame, we have the colonization of the Pacific, and in our three movies, we've covered some of the pathways people took to get there. The trans-Pacific voyages of the Hamudu people from the Yellow Sea between 7,000 and 5,000 years ago may well be the beginning of the story of the Polynesians. The 4,500 Rua Tanifa carving and the 5,500-year-old ship Noel Hillium found suggests they also came to New Zealand. We saw evidence to suggest that Maui came from Egypt bringing Kiore, the Polynesian rat, 2,200 years ago. And as we saw in the previous episode, the red-haired Hotu people came from Peru 1,800 years ago. So as you can see, the history of the Polynesians is complex. But one thing we would like to emphasize is that there is no line that can be drawn between any of these people, as it appears from oral histories that whenever and wherever there was contact, there was intermarriage. So the Maori have links back to the first people who made Eotearoa their home. A lot of these early tribes, the ones that have actually survived, have formed what is now Maori culture. Maori culture is not just one set of people who arrived at one time. It is a conglomeration, it is a melting pot of probably hundreds of different tribes that have contributed their energy, their culture, their stories, their ways, their tools, all sorts of different things to what is now Maori culture. But although scientists have been trying to unravel this amazing history, they are being thwarted at every turn. Groundbreaking discoveries are made, but they continue to be swept under the carpet before anyone can connect the dots to other studies that have also been hidden from the public eye. Why have there not been more archaeological studies undertaken at the location of the Manuka tree stump? Why hasn't anybody investigated the ancient ship Noel Hillium found? And why haven't there been more studies done on the Moa middens discovered under the Taupo ash? Why have Matisu Smith's and Holdaway's findings on the rat DNA been pushed aside? And why? as Bruce McFadgen attacked and denigrated both Price's and Holdaway's work. These groundbreaking findings could open up new fields of research that would surely explain this complex and exciting Pacific prehistory. But why isn't this being done? Because it would mean that the history of New Zealand would have to be rewritten. For people to have a sense of identity, knowledge of their history is vital. When that history has been erased or altered, pride and understanding is compromised. And that's what's happening in New Zealand today. Nobody dares rewrite the history to tell the truth, only to rewrite it to bury the truth. And for what reason? Well. We'll leave that for you to decide. Kia tu ngā mana ki tāna e te ao.